the conqueror of the ten directions, the universal ruler, and the most successful subjugator in the history of Southeast Asia. This is the immense legacy left behind by Emperor Bayanag of Tunggu, a legacy that would be passed on to his son, Nanda Bayan, a legacy that would be impossible to surpass and challenging to even match, an awe-inspiring inheritance that would quickly prove to be its own downfall. Nanda Bayan was born in 1535, the first son of a nobleman named Bayanog and the sister of King Tabanshwadi of Tunggu, Thakan Giyu. Nanda only had one other full-blooded sibling, an older sister named Mabia. Throughout his lifetime, Nanda would be sibling to 85 others, as his father would go on to marry a total of 95 women. Nanda would grow up in the Tunggu capital of Pegu, alongside the children of Tabanshwadi. In 1542, at the age of seven, Nanda Bayan becomes the third in line for the throne of Tunggu, as Tabanshwadi had declared his childhood friend, Bayanog, as his royal brother and named him as his heir apparent. Nando would be well educated, with a strong emphasis on military training as he grew older. By the time he was 13, Prince Nanda joined his father and Tabanshwedi on their 1547 campaign of Thailand. This invasion would see Tabanshwedi's armies majorly defeated for the first time in his 15 year military career. The largest battle during this war would break out just in front of the walls of the Thai capital of Ayutthaya. During this battle, Nanda Bayan showed bravery and was granted military honors, although it is unclear how much this 13-year-old actually contributed to the state of the battle. This campaign would come to an end after a failed siege of Ayutthaya and a retreat back to Tunggu. Three years after the Siam campaign, Emperor Tabanshwedi would be assassinated and Bayanog was supposed to become the ruler of Tunggu. Instead, Tabanshwadi's empire devolved into rebellion in every corner. Nanda Bayan, his sister, and his mother were all forced to flee the city of Tunggu where they resided, as the half-brother of Bayanog declared himself the new king of Tunggu. After being on the run for nearly a year, the family is reunited with Bayanog as he moves to reconquer Tunggu province. In early 1551, Bayanog takes Tunggu City and shortly thereafter formally crowns himself as king, alongside his son's coronation as crown prince. From this point onward, Nanda would become an increasingly active general in Bayanog's military, accompanying his father and uncles, who held central command of the campaigns. Bayanog would always take into consideration Nanda's military advice, although Bayanog knew better in most scenarios. In 1564, Nanda would be the leader of his first campaign. His assignment was to conquer the land of Langjiang and capture its king, Seta Thirith. The crown prince managed to take the Langjiang capital of Vientiane, but Seta Thirith had escaped into the jungles. Nanda Bayan installed a puppet king in Vientiane and started after his chase for the king. This would prove a mistake, as the elusive king of Langjiang picked off Nanda Bayan's army and led him deep into the countryside before the prince decided to retreat. Hereafter, Bayanog never let Nanda lead a campaign, although he did remain commanding contingents on the ground for the next 15 years, as his father and uncles oversaw the campaigns that would form the largest empire in Southeast Asia. In 1579, Nanda took on a greater role in governing the empire, as Bayanog had become ill. In 1580, Bayanog would order his last campaign, the conquest of the small but mighty Kingdom of Arakan. The Tunggu managed to take the southern half of Arakan before Bayanog died in 1581. This would leave Nanda Bayan as the inheritor of the largest and most overextended empire in the history of Southeast Asia. Nanda, expecting his inheritance to follow a similar path that his fathers had, immediately withdraws from the Arakan campaign and signs a peace treaty with the unconquerable inhabitants of the Rakhine coast. He would need all the soldiers he could muster to hold the Tunggu Empire together. As 1581 turned into 1582, Nanda waited for the vassal kings loyal to his father to send their yearly tribute. One by one, each and every one of them arrives in Pegu, entering through their respective gate. All but one, that is. As expected, a rebellion breaks out against Nanda upon his coronation, although on a much smaller scale than anticipated. The tiny Shan state of Sanda, far to the north, 
takes this opportunity to attempt a breakaway from Tonggu. Nanda immediately orders for a local army to crush this. By late 1582, the fortress of Sanda is taken, and the rebellion is ended. Nanda had passed his initial challenge of securing the empire. However, this was nowhere near the end of instability in Tonggu. The governor of Ava and the half-brother of Bayanog, Thado Minsa, was not invited to the 1582 Sanda campaign. He was left slighted by this as he was the closest relative and most experienced general to the rebellion. By 1583, he sent out letters to the nearby governors of Tonggu, Prome, and Lan Na, two of which were the other surviving brothers of the late Bayanog. He instructed them that he was preparing to rebel against their nephew and rule northern Burma as a separate entity. All three of these letters were received and quickly forwarded to Emperor Ananda. A familial civil war was on the horizon. Not only was Thado Minsa the uncle of Nanda, but he was also married to Nanda's only full-blooded sibling, his older sister, Mabia. This would give Thado Minsa a degree of legitimacy to his rebellion, as he could now cite that he was simply taking his and his wife's half of Bayanog's inheritance. Once Nanda received notice of Thado Minsa's intentions, he called upon his vassals from central Burma and the eastern territories of Langjiang and Siam to assemble in the capital. All but one of these armies would arrive. Nanda marches on Ava and arrives under the walls in April of 1584. Thado Minsa could nowhere near match the military might of almost the entirety of the Tungu Empire. Instead of fighting Nanda in a pitched battle that he would most assuredly lose, he challenged his nephew to single combat atop their war elephants. Nanda had spent a considerable amount of time commanding contingents of armies under Thado Minsa and had probably learned some important tricks of the trade from him, making this duel ever more dramatic, as teacher met disciple. The two elephants and their riders charged at one another, neither finding their swings hit home on the other. This endured for some time as the two combatants matched each other on every ride by. At some point, perhaps after an injury to himself or his elephant, Thado Minsa fled from the duel and escaped into the countryside with his small army. He died shortly after this, suggesting that he was probably wounded in the engagement. Hereafter, Nandabayan appointed his cousin, and the son of Emperor Tabanshwedi, the loyal Min Letya, as the governor of Ava. With the defeat of Thado Minsa, peace was restored to the Tungu Empire. But there is still one very pressing issue. One of the vassal armies that Nanda ordered on this campaign never showed up. The largest and most rebellious subject, Siam. With the memory of a hard-fought rebellion in 1569 still fresh in the minds of the Thai, the king of Siam, Maha Thamaracha, declared independence from Tunggu in May of 1584. By this, it appears that the king of Siam was waiting for cracks to show in Nanda's empire, and the rebellion of Thado Minsa was the perfect chance to pounce. While the army of Siam ordered to Pegu by Emperor Nanda never showed up at the capital, it did mobilize under their crown prince, a young man named Naraswan. Naraswan had grown up in Pegu for a large portion of his childhood, alongside Nanda Bayan's children and the other hostage children of Tungu's many vassal kings. From a young age, he had shown a depth skill in military strategy, and now, a general trained in the art of Burmese warfare, sat just across the river from Pegu with a 6,000-man army. Before Emperor Ananda could return from his elephant duel at Ava, he ordered for a 5,000-man army to chase Naraswan back to Thailand. The small force found the army of Naraswan. The only thing separating the two was the flowing waters of the Sitang River. Seeing the opposing army, Prince Naraswan sought to find a victory without fighting a battle, and with only firing one shot. Naraswan, holding a musket with an incredibly long barrel, took his aim and fired across the Sitang River. A moment later, the leader of the Tungu army fell dead from his elephant. After this, Naraswan returned to Thailand without a fight and prepared to meet a Tungu invasion, leaving the leaderless 5,000 men across the Sitang River at a standstill. Emperor Nanda returned to Pegu shortly after Naraswan evacuated, along with his son and the crown prince, Swa, he gathers a force of 6,000 to join the other 5,000. This army, led by Nanda, intended to reconquer their pesky Siamese vassal. 
There were only three problems with that. One, and perhaps most pressing, was that 11,000 men was simply not enough to take Thailand. Two, the campaign was hastily planned by Nanda, whose only strategy was to march on the capital city of Ayutthaya. Lastly, the campaign would start in the middle of the rainy season. Nanda would enter Thailand and march towards the Chao Phraya River, where he would then march down the banks until reaching Ayutthaya. Do you see where this is going? Nanda's small army got caught in the marshes of a flooded river in the rainy season, while small Thai war canoes maneuvered around his army and severely defeated them. Nanda was forced to retreat from Thailand, as the independence of Siam was secured during their initial rebellion. Nanda and the remnants of his defeated army returned to Pegu. The loss of Siam, while it was surely a big hit, did not threaten to tear the empire apart directly. What threatened to tear the empire apart was the other vassals of Tungu, who could now look at this rebellion and see that the empire of Nanda was weak and could be defeated. This brought up the question of, is it possible, and at that point, even worth it to reconquer Siam? If it was anything like Bayanog and Tabanshwedi's campaigns that Nanda was both present at, then the answer would be no. No, the rebellious subject was not worth the trouble. But Nanda's hand would be forced into acting, lest he lose the loyalty of his remaining vassals. To win the favor of his people and the gods, Nanda donated five large and well-sculpted statues of Buddha to various monasteries in Pegu. Maybe this would allow him to reconquer Siam. In 1586, the Tungu armies reassembled to the number of 12,000, which was still not enough to subdue their southern rival. This time, they would be led by the eldest of Nanda's 19 children, Crown Prince Swa. His strategy had evolved to more than just a bum rush to Ayutthaya. The plan was to invade from northern Thailand and cut the country in two from east to west until he reached the capital. There was only one thing in the way of Crown Prince Swa, and that was his contemporary Crown Prince of Siam, Naraswan. Naraswan had anticipated the Tungu strategy and held himself in a fort guarding the northern border of Siam. A siege ensued in which Naraswan managed to hold back Prince Swa until the salvation of the rainy season and a Tungu withdrawal. The campaign would resume in 1587. This time Nanda sent his son with a force of 27,000, a sizable army that had more of a chance at conquering Siam, but only about half the number Bayanog had used on two separate occasions and he barely won those wars. Regardless, the invasion began on the same course as the previous one, starting from the north. Crown Prince Swa overcame the fortress that had halted him in the previous year. From here, he marched his way down the river that eventually connected to Ayutthaya. He arrived before the walls with his army mostly intact. While he reached the capital, Ayutthaya was a whole nother beast in itself. Boasting some of the best defenses in Southeast Asia, this island fortress would be a challenge for anyone to take. The large army was simply not prepared for the long siege that they were forced into. After a few months in front of the walls of Ayutthaya, Prince Swa withdrew and started the long march back to friendly territories. The withdrawal quickly turned into retreat as Prince Naraswan chased the Tungu army the whole way, harassing them at any chance he got in a great display of guerrilla warfare. By the time the Tungu army returned to Pegu, there was nearly nothing left of their 27,000-man army. The campaign was put to a stop by Nanda as he debated the Siamese question again. As predicted, it was appearing ever more so that Thailand was not worth the trouble of tens of thousands of dead Tungu soldiers. The other subjects of Tungu began to take notice of the increasing weakness of Nanda's realm. The Shan state of Inya, in the heart of the empire, revolted. It would take the Tungu armies a total of seven months to subdue them, an easy campaign that would have taken the armies of Bayanog mere weeks to put down. Witnessing this rebellion in the center of his empire put Nanda Bayan on edge. In the following year, 1588, he started to appoint more relatives as governors and vassal kings of the empire. This would have the positive effect of making the Tungu empire more stable during good times, but it would also have the adverse effect of making the empire more susceptible to mass rebellion in the event that Nanda's empire begins to collapse. 
In 1590, an opportunity to retake Thailand emerged when King Thamaracha died and left his son, Naraswan, to become the new monarch. Nanda thought that this would weaken Siam, but he couldn't have been more wrong. The emperor assembled his largest army to date, some 30,000 men to restore his empire. Now this was an army that could conquer Siam, but it would never arrive fully intact. In 1590, the troublesome Shan state farthest to the north, Mogong, revolted against the empire. This would force Emperor Nanda to split his 30,000-man army intended for Thailand. 10,000, under the leadership of Nanda's nephew, Natsheng Nong, would march north to subdue Mogong, while 20,000 under Crown Prince Swa would continue the Siam campaign as intended. Being stretched from their most northern region to their most southern, the Tungu Empire looked as if it might snap. Prince Swa took his normal route of invading Thailand from the north, but the now King Naraswan was prepared to meet him. Held up in the same fortress where he had initially defeated Prince Swa, he again holds the Tungu at bay before they're forced to retreat. Upon the army's return to Pegu, a frustrated Nanda berates his son, and if he wasn't losing enough already, he orders to execute the other top generals in the campaign. While the fourth invasion of Siam was as much of a disaster as the other ones, the Mogong campaign did manage to find success, putting two separate revolts down until the northern Shan were finally subdued in 1592. In that same year, King Naraswan started to go on the offensive, raiding vast portions of the Tenasserim coast before returning to the safety of Siam. This would prompt a fifth invasion of Siam as 24,000 men under Prince Swa set forth towards Thailand. King Naraswan sent out a small detachment of men to lure the Burmese prince into an ambush. Despite having the element of surprise, the Thai forces were outnumbered by their foe, who quickly turned the tides of the battle in their favor. All appeared lost, as Naraswan looked as if he may suffer his first defeat. Naraswan, who was himself in the midst of combat, had one more trick up his sleeve. Surrounded by the chaos of war, he roared across the battlefield, challenging Prince Swa to an elephant duel. The crown prince, had he declined, most likely would have won the battle. Instead, his arrogance saw him accept the challenge. As boys, these two men probably sparred together in Pegu. This would be one final rematch. Winner takes all. Prince Swa swung first, missing Naraswan in a diagonal attack. Naraswan, in response, stands in his saddle and swings down on the prince. He splits his skull and kills the future ruler of Tungu. This duel would lead to the defeat of the Tungu army, who retreated without their prince back to Pegu. This death, more than anything, symbolized the future of the Tungu empire. It was doomed to fall, just as its future ruler had fallen from his elephant. Concluding this crushing victory, Naraswan goes on the offensive again and captures much of the southern part of the Tenasserim coast as he begins to chip away at the Tungu Empire. With the death of his eldest son, the next in line to become Crown Prince of Tungu was his brother, Kwayawaswa. Not only this loss, but Emperor Nanda also had to deal with a rebellion just outside of Pegu. It was easily stomped out, but this was a terrible sign of things to come. If the subjects of Tungu this close to the capital were brave enough to rebel, then that meant that everybody else in the empire was as well. King Naraswan resumed his campaign, taking the rest of the Tenasserim coast with little fight until reaching the city of Martaban. Here, the garrison of this highly defensible city give up without a fight. The Thai king was beginning to be viewed as a liberator by the ethnically Mon people of the southern Tungu Empire. They join his army as he quickly marches on Pegu itself. When King Naraswan arrived under the 20 gates of Pegu, Nanda was completely caught off guard. He hadn't expected Naraswan to march this deep into his empire, and he hadn't even assembled an army to match the King of Siam. Before the siege could begin, Nanda sent out for aid from his vassals to the north, while the new crown prince, Kwayawaswa, began to conscript everyone he could into the Tungu army including the elderly and even Buddhist monks who had devoted their lives to peace. 
Nariswan puts Pegu to the siege for the better part of a year, attempting to take the city where he had spent a large portion of his childhood. Eventually, a number of the vassals that Nanda had called upon arrive at Pegu to relieve the siege. Upon hearing of the arrival of these armies, Nariswan decides to return to Siam in 1595. All but one of the vassal kings called upon came to the aid of Emperor Nanda, that being the governor of Prome, Nanda's own son, Dado Damayaza. If his father couldn't even protect his own capital, then how was he supposed to defend Prome? The armies of Prome managed to take the ever-important city of Pagan, and even besieged the city of Tonggu, where they're finally repelled. In under a year, the three most important cities at the center of the Tonggu Empire had been besieged. While only one of these cities was taken, this showed the increasing weakness of the realm. If Nanda couldn't defend these three key cities, then how is he supposed to defend the vastness of the empire that his father had created? Seeing the imminent collapse of the Tunggu Empire made their most eastern vassal, Lang Zhang, declare independence in a mostly bloodless matter. The Tunggu decided not to respond, and this was a good decision, if Sadathira's son was anything like his father. The revolt of Nanda's son in Prome continued being the pressing issue. Eventually in 1597, Nanda's brother, the governor of Ava, Nian Gion, retook the city of Pagan from Prome and pushed that Odamayaza back to his original domains as governor. The map now looked eerily identical to how it did when Tungu first emerged onto the political scene in 1510. The governor of Tungu province, and Nanda's cousin, Thayafu, alongside Nanda's own brother, Narada Minsa of Lan Na, started a joint rebellion. Everyone with any kind of connection with Nanda was now trying to gain a slice of the collapsing Tungu Empire. The Shan, as well as Manipur, used this opportunity to break away from Pegu as well. This new set of rebellions would cut the still loyal portions of Nanda's empire in half, thereby forcing his brother, Neongion of Ava, to start acting mostly on his own accord, although he never formally declared himself independent from Nanda. His realm would prove to be the most stable in the fallen empire. Exactly at the Tungu Empire's weakest point is exactly when the nation of Arakan was finally awakened. Seeking revenge from previous campaigns, the king of Arakan, Razagiyu, allied himself to the rebel king of Tungu province, Thayathu. With Arakan's powerful navy and the manpower of Tungu province, the two armies invaded what was left of Nanda's once massive empire in 1598. For that year, the rebellious cousin of Nanda took a town located directly outside of Pegu. With this as their base of operations, they waited until the next year to march on the capital. In March of 1599, Arakanese marines land just south of Pegu and claim the land as their own until they arrived at the walls of Pegu, meeting their ally there by April. The combined force lays siege to the capital, but the walls, no matter how bad their leader, always seemed to stand strong. This would be no short siege, if Nanda really wished to keep his city. While Nanda was determined to continue the fight, his son and the crown prince, Kwayawaswa, saw the plain despair of the situation and surrendered to his cousin shortly after the siege had begun. He was promised fair treatment and was sent to the city of Tungu. The siege continued until December of 1599, and just before the turn of the new century, Nanda Bayan surrendered to his rebellious cousin. Following this, Pegu was burned, and its vast treasury, acquired from the farthest reaches of mainland Southeast Asia, were split amongst the allied Arakanese and rebel Tungu forces. The rebel Tungu then took the rest of Nanda's empire, as Arakan held onto the land that they had conquered. The Tungu Empire was no more and it had fallen at the hands of Nanda Bayan. But was it really his fault? He inherited an impossible position, and it was unlikely that he could have held the whole empire together, although he did try. I can identify two main mistakes that Nanda Bayan made that led to the total collapse of Tonggu. First and foremost, he should have just left Siam after the first or second time he tried to reconquer it. 
He wasted over 100,000 men during the course of five separate invasions, for nothing. Containing an independent Siam would have been a much easier task, and he probably could have kept the rest of his empire held together. The second mistake that Nanda made was not commanding his own armies after his second campaign as emperor. Nanda was by no means a military strategist like Bayanog, but he had proven that he was a more than capable field commander. Had the emperor of Tungu been present at some of the battles and campaigns, then maybe they would have found more victories. Regardless, the emperor's surrender was accepted by his cousin. He was forced to capitulate his royal title, but would be allowed to live as an honored guest in the city of Tungu. Arriving at the city, he likely expected to see his son, Kwayawaswa. However, he had been assassinated, despite being promised a good treatment. Nanshing Nong, the nephew of Nanda, and governor of Tungu City under the new regime, had killed him for unknown reasons. This probably made Nanda Bayan paranoid, as unlike his son, Nanshing Nong had a reason to despise Nanda. Nanda had rejected the marriage of Nanshing Nong to his true love, Yaza Datu Kalaya. The reason was because she was the widow of Nanda's first son, the dead Prince Swa. The nervous Nanda's life came into immediate danger shortly after he arrived in Tungu City. In the year 1600, the vengeful king of Thailand, Naraswan, came knocking at the city of Tungu. He wanted one thing and one thing only, the retired emperor. This was rejected, and the city came under siege. However, it didn't last for long before Naraswan left to deal with more local matters in Thailand. Nanda would celebrate his 65th birthday as a captive in Tungu City. At the end of that same month of November, he was betrayed and executed like his son, on the orders of Nanshing Nong. In the short time that it existed, the Tungu Empire rose from a small backwater city-state to become the largest empire in the history of Southeast Asia. Its dramatic rise was almost as fast as its inevitable fall. So, how did this even happen? How did this empire rise from nothing to the most powerful empire in Asia, with the exception of Ming China? The answer lies with its rulers. All four kings and subsequent emperors of Tungu were extremely competent men even Nanda Bayan, although he may be on the lower end of that spectrum. The growth and collapse of the Tungu Empire is nothing more than the Leviathan itself, working in hyperspeed. The Leviathan is a theory that a society will eat itself alive by becoming what it despises the most. Tungu rose under the peace-loving King Niao as a hotspot for refugees attempting to escape a war-torn Burma. The Tungu Empire was built by the endless wars of Tavan Shwedi and the ever-expanding Bayanog. This empire collapsed under Nanda Bayan and became the war-torn land that refugees were initially trying to escape. 